for coming today. My name is Abby Big. I'm the coordinator for CAFE, the Center for Advancing Faculty Excellence. We're really excited because today we have Lori Myers presenting on design thinking. Um, Lori is a lecturer in the Department of Arts, Languages, and Philosophy. Um, and she teaches courses on design thinking to students of all majors. Um, so this is applicable to everyone here. We're very excited to have you. So Thank Lori, you. I'll continue your way. Thank you. Uh, I had lunch with David Summers, Dr. David Summers, on Monday, and he said, write stuff down so that you don't start telling a lot of stories and take too much time. Um, you know, Dr. Summers, we're going to miss him. He's off to Maine. So, um, anyway, the, the need for creative ideas has never been greater. Uh, teaching students the design thinking mindset proves to um, encourage them and empower them to collaborate, um, use communication, uh, build their communication skills, um, creative arts, and prototyping. So it truly empowers them. Um, I am Laurie Myers, and I hope to give you a glimmer of uh, the importance of design thinking and what it is um, today in education. So design thinking is, is truly a, an opportunity for creativity. Today's employer, employers are looking for a creative workforce. Um, creative thinking is, is obviously a skill in demand in nearly every single industry. Um, creative thinking is, is frequently used when interacting with clients or developing innovative strategies. And did you know that creative or creativity is regarded as one of the top three personality traits um, most important to success in any career. So design thinking is a mindset. I mean, you hear it often as a process, uh, but it's a, a, a mindset. And thinking like a designer can truly transform um, your world and the way you see the world. Design thinking helps us um, be more aware of the world around us. Um, it helps us realize that we truly play a part in our environment and the success around us. Um, design thinking encourages people to take action towards things that are, that are bothersome or challenging or things that they see that could you need or use improvement, regardless of what it is, regardless of if it's at home, um, if it's at school, if it's at work, if it's in your community, or um, a, even a global concern. Um, so design thinking, it, it gives us um, creative confidence to take action when we're faced with a difficult challenge. Design thinking kind of takes a, a different uh, a different point from making people want things to making things that people want or need. So what is design thinking? I don't know if you've heard, heard much about design thinking. It's not, it's not anything new in the business world, but it, it has continued to gain uh, popularity in classes and in education over the last several years. So design thinking is often confused with visual design. I'll have students sign up for, for Art 3500, Innovation Through Design Thinking, and they, said, yeah. and they think that they're coming into a visual design class. But it's actually a process, and we develop that into a mindset. Simply put, it's a user-centered approach um, to problem solving. Um, it's actually a picture of Steve Jobs, so use your imagination. Um, why was Steve Jobs so successful? Anyone? Anyone? Mueller? Go ahead. The last one I didn't write on the previous slide. Based on empathetic research, so it's based on your user. Who are you designing for? Instead of designing something and then thinking people will like it, first you see what your um, 
client or whoever you're designing for wants or needs or what their desires are. So mind mapping also fits in here. Absolutely. Too. Yes. Yes, sir. Are we still on the Steve Jobs question? Yes. Uh, Steve, Steve Jobs. <laughs> I, I, I believe Steve Jobs was so successful because he was able to invent products that nobody even knew they needed. Yes. I mean, yes. How great was that? That's, uh, right. He believed that the computer would change the world. I would say he was right, wouldn't you? But yes. Okay. Um, well, what about Michelangelo? We're still talking about Michelangelo. Everybody knows who Michelangelo was, right? Um, why was he so successful? I mean, basically, he used all his skills as an architect and an engineer and a mathematician and a poet and an artist. He used all these different skills and interests that he had, um, you know, to create machines that the world wasn't even ready for or didn't have the materials to build. Okay? So, I'm a visual person, so we just lost some images, but that's okay. I, I can deal with it. Um, again, design thinking is human-centered. It's based on empathetic research. It's a positive collaboration um, and interaction to create a problem solving. And in a nutshell, it's making life better for others, working together to make life better for others. Um, but look around you. Looking around at things around you, not, not really people, but um, can you find something that was not designed? Find anything that was not designed? No. All right, well, from the same Okay. okay. <laughs> you could put some bites in it and do some cool, fun little design with that. Okay. Well, from my research and experience, I believe and have found that the design thinking process, um, or with that process, you could design a better chair, a more useful phone. A, a more like a better pen or pencil, um, a plate that would be more useful or desirable. Okay. All right. This will not show up, will it? Yeah, probably not. So um, let me just kind of go back to where this really became popular. Has anyone heard of uh, the brothers David and Tom Kelly? No. no, and yes. Well, I had a picture of them, but if you can look it up if you want. David and Tom Kelly are the co-founders of um, the design firm IDEO. Have you heard of IDEO? Yes and no? Okay. Well, it is a company that's committed to um, just creating a positive impact um, by designing through design thinking through this process. David is an engineer and um, a professor at Stanford, and Tom recently authored a popular book called Creative Confidence, um, which is an incredible book. Um, it's called Unleashing, Unleashing the Creative Potential Within Us All. Um, it's a great book if you're interested in looking at it or borrowing it. Um, it's something we use in my class as well. All right? Well, design thinking is, I always think we should call it design doing because it truly is more about doing and less about thinking. Um, we do a lot of rapid prototyping with cheap or inexpensive materials or just things that we can find. Um, I've discovered that students can be more creative if they're kind of limited with what they can use and with the time that they place into that, honestly. Um, being observant, talking to others, thinking outside of the box so it does not have to be practical, and then not being afraid to fail, all right? So there's, there's key elements to design thinking. Um, the four key elements are, we keep going back to, it's human-centered, right? I always tell my students, if you don't remember anything all semester, remember to start with the people you are designing for first, human-centered. It's highly creative, um, hands-on, and definitely iterative. Yes, sir? I, I have a question about the creativity. Mm -hmm. um, as an engineer, I find creativity to be extremely difficult. 
uh, brute force is the uh, preferred method. You know, do lots of math. Uh, just to, just uh, apply a uh, a procedure or a recipe to the problem. How, how do you tap into the creativity? How how can you tap into this 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 power of creativity? I great great question. Um, I have found that challenging sometimes. Um, I have a lot of students that come to my classes that do not believe they're creative. Um, so we talk about, well, what is creative? Are we talking, can you draw anything you can see? Mm, that's not really creative. That's maybe being artistic. Um, but uh, I primarily focus on, can you solve a problem? You know, how can we, um, and, and then just getting their, getting their feet wet and their hands moving with um, rapid prototyping. And I think that they're pleasantly surprised that they're naturally creative because it's really about problem solving more than anything. I mean, cavemen were creative, right? Um, that's where I go with it. Does that help? <laughs> okay, maybe when we get going here, you can start feeling creative, okay? Hopefully. Empathy is the key, though, when you're designing uh, for someone else, okay? When you're, when you're designing for someone else, though, you want to think, what are their needs? What are their motivations? What is important to them? Um, and you do that by talking to them and observing them. Um, it's just about understanding their feelings and needs. Um, so it's highly creative, it encourages you to look at a problem in a different way, and again it's a process, it's on the, the process or mindset that we use is on that first copy of that packet um, that you have. The process helps you come up with a variety of solutions, um, and it goes beyond and improves what your existing alternatives um, are. It's a creative looking block, isn't it? Okay, so being able to pick up a prototype and interact with it um, really helps bring that creative aspect to life and helps people and helps you understand um, the innovation or brings the innovation to life. And failure is necessary. And SNT students don't like to fail. And I'm not saying failing the class. I'm saying, you know, failing at the design and revisiting it. It's iterative. I teach this process um, in a linear fashion. However, uh, we, you can start anywhere on it. I always start with empathy just because I believe that's the most important thing um, or the most important aspect. Um, so you loop through that process and sometimes you go back and revisit. Uh, it's going to eventually be more creative than you were right. really intending it to be that way necessarily. Right. I mean, I, I, I know I'll never be the, the, the kind of, of engineer or, or artist that, you know, like Da Vinci or, or, or even Dyson or, or, or you know, some of the famous uh, you know, Nikola Tesla. But, but, but I would like to tap into a little bit of that genius. Well, the way that you tap into it. where he was was by being analytical and looking yes. at how things work. Right. So you're more creative than you yeah, think, I guarantee. Yeah, Mike and, and, Mike and I were, were discussing how actually the analytical we could, we could free you from the whole optimization process, right? Which is what the engineers tend to focus more yeah. on how to optimize, how to get more results for less. So it's more that's more focusing on the outcome. Well, what we say, and often happens with the arts and philosophy, is the process, the thought, mm -hmm. the, right? the idea. So yeah. it's just different ways of looking at it. Efficiency itself can be beautiful. Yes, and but it should be at the expense of. It doesn't have to be. No. Yeah, exactly. not at all. I, I do find that I, I am the most creative when I'm in, in a team and not by myself. Excellent. And, and, and when, when we're going through a, a process of, of brainstorming and encouraging one another to 
put out as many crazy ideas yes, as possible. Because if you don't get crazy, then you're not yeah. going to go to the next level. You're not going to get a step change. You're going to get more of the same that you've already had before. Yeah. Excellent. I appreciate the conversation. Not on your phones or asleep or anything. I appreciate that. So starting broad or very general is um, where you want to start exploring. <laughs> every challenge or problem, um, uh, every idea until it's just completely exhausted. So you start really broad. And so sometimes it's very ill-defined um, before you can become specific. So... Uh, you know, where or when can design thinking be applied? It doesn't work for every problem. Um, it really works well for those wicked problems or tricky, ill-defined problems. Uh, and a large part is defining the actual problem. One of the uh, things I have my students do, which um, we have in your packet here, you can... Oh, maybe we don't. It's okay. I, I, Abby, bless her heart, I sent her like four different emails. <laughs> um, basically what I do is I give them a sheet of paper and it says, what bothers you? Spend one full day writing down things that bother you. Um, just one day. Don't want them to focus on too many negative things, you know, because I don't want them to spend a week, because I won't, don't want them to come back to me all grumpy cat at me, you know. Um, and most of them put something about getting up in the morning, waking up in the morning, too tired to get out of bed. That's a real common um, thing that they put that bothers them. And some of them, that's the only thing that really, really bothers them. But when we start talking about it, and depending on the person, and depending on the team, that's not the problem. The problem is staying up, playing video games too late, or studying for their, their physics exam too late. That doesn't look involved, well, never mind. Um, anyway, uh, or looking at their phone too long, or whatever. So it's, or maybe their roommate snores. Okay, so the, a large part of design thinking, again, is defining the actual <clears throat> problem. But you have to be willing to, to uh, leave your comfort zone of the way you normally organize things. All right, so if we focus on people and their needs instead of a specific technology um, and other conditions, then innovation leads to radical, unique, um, experiences and development and then more needs are met whether it's in a business corporation office home classroom regardless okay, good, that one shows up. so there's no single process that serves every challenge um, but this five-step process um, that that is based from the D school um, is one that has truly been proven to be successful and very valuable. So I teach all of my students um, this process. Um, I have taught as young as fourth grade and then as old as, wow, I'm teaching adults here, right? Um, and um, the process, it, it just really, with the hands-on interaction, is very collaborative and innovative, and it's fun. Um, it's fun to see what people um, come up with. So, I don't know if, if any of you would maybe remember Hannah Mills. Hannah was our Renaissance um, Award winner two years ago, I believe. Amazing young lady. Um, she's a mechanical engineer now. She is working for Make in Birmingham. And uh, <laughs> she sent me this uh, really long thing that she wanted me to tell you, and I just put part of it up here. But it's super exciting that, um, you know, she says she has always been in love with design 
um, and making better products, but it wasn't until she was introduced to the design thinking process um, that it taught her how to think about people first. And that became her driving force um, that has helped her be successful. She also has stated um, or told me a couple of jobs that she's interviewed for, they ask her, do you know the design thinking process? Um, and when she came to make, um, they said, okay, we're going to have a workshop on design thinking. And she's like, oh, I know it. She was the only one in the group that did. Um, so why not teach them at least some of this before they move on, right? Um, anybody know Rob? Rob um, Achenbach, Achenbach. Uh, he was on the, do you remember Rob? Yeah. On the design team? Well, you maybe don't remember him because he didn't usually have a mustache, you know? <laughs> and uh, I guess he just liked the, that picture. But anyway, he sent me this even longer explanation of why he thinks design thinking was so important to him um, as a graduate of S&T. Um, he worked on, loves to work on race cars. He was on the design team, and he's just a very um, specific, detailed kind of guy. And he worked and worked on making uh, the race car faster through the, the design and, and everything. Uh, but what he decided, because things kept kind of becoming a failure, and he became frustrated. And then after all this failure, he approached the driver and said, you know, what do you need to drive this car? Because it's a great car, but I think we can get it going faster. Um, so instead of first defaulting to physics, he went to the driver and said, what do you need? What do you want? And they, they, brought, they were very general and then brought it down to the steering wheel. And he, and he says, yeah, it was a duh answer, but it proved success to start with the user. All right? I, if I could stop mm -hmm. talking for just a minute, and I'd like to introduce a couple of guys here. This is uh, Musad, and I had Musad in class a couple of semesters ago. I love keeping in contact with these people. Will you give us your little blurb of yeah. how it's helpful to you? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Musad Akhrif, and don't worry, you don't have to pronounce my last name because it's kind of confusing. Uh, what I would like to share is how much did design thinking process did affect my life. When I think about like different self, and when I say that, Miss Laura may may have may have like an heart attack because basically what I think is I think too much and I don't think at the same time. Think about the general idea. Don't think about like details, don't think about equations like I said. Don't put your ideas or your creative thoughts into like in comparison with others. I believe, I have no more some personal beliefs, I believe that Einstein wasn't a genius. Steve Jobs wasn't a genius, but they had the creative thoughts or the creative ideas that nobody else think about. That would make them, that would make them like geniuses. When we talk, uh, when we talk about, let's say, being an electrical engineering major, we have to like start programming. We have to create robots. We have to actually create something physically for like our clients. So I usually follow the method I call WWH, which is what is the problem, why it is a problem, and how should I fix it might be like just a simple idea but there is more than one solution for just one problem one plus one equal two but also three minus one equal two I mean it's kind of crazy but it's logical when you think about stuff real small but you can actually create so much more out of it uh, when we talk about like design thinking it doesn't have to be like you create an actual physical thing. You don't have to create a device. You can use these thoughts or these processes with your own with your own life. Let's per se 
I want to use that thinking process in my own life. So who's the client? It's myself. I need to do something to actually get better in my life. So I would organize my life much better if I did think about a lot of big stuff than talk about a lot of small stuff. So basically it's not think outside, outside, the, outside the box, but actually from the outside, think about all the general ideas. Then in each time just get deeper and deeper and deeper into the box. You don't have to you don't have to meet all the requirements because basically if I would make just a regular cell phone, I have to compare myself to Apple, I have to compare myself to Samsung, I have to compare myself to Blackberry, Nokia, and many other companies. They make a lot of phones. We have everyone here have a phone, but what makes my phone is unique is the creative idea, the creative feature I did with the time and effort to actually think about it. All, all the phones are like kind of squares. Why do I have to make like a square phone? I, have, I mean, there is one way which I could get a lot of features, but with different designs. That would make me unique. The design thinking process is not you being smart or, or not, it's about you being yourself, you don't compare yourself to other people's ideas, and the more you get, the more people will think you are smart. Like I said, Einstein, he wasn't smart at first. Everyone thought he was dumb. But the problem is, nobody believed in his crazy idea. So go on, <laughs> like think about crazy idea. Think about the different solution for the same simple problem. And I would recommend the uh, I would recommend a book that I've read like two years ago uh, called Think Like a Freak. <laughs> no, I'm serious. <laughs> Think, Think Like, like a, a Freak. Child. And there is another book called Think Like a Child. These books did define the design thinking process over the years. Even a lot of people not use it with like just creating something. They use it in like wars and battles and stuff like that. So basically, design thinking process is much more deeper than you think. It's not about like business, but it's about to get the result that somebody wants with your own ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Musa. Ben? Right. This, this is Ben Wilt, and he is a mechanical underwater robotics. Um, really excited. He has only been in my class for, well, the semester. So we'll see if he gets it. He's the quiz. No, I'm just kidding. Right, so um, I'm on the underwater robotics team, as she said. I'm a mechanical engineer um, student right now. Uh, I'm the head uh, mechanical engineer for the, the underwater robotics team, so I'm kind of um, over all the kids and kind of the newer freshmen and even all the seniors that we have on the team trying to get them to do uh, new things. through. Um, design thinking, you kind of do stuff a little bit differently. So in all the classes that we take, it's very step by step, right? You have step one, you have step two, you have step three, and the whole time you do math and more math, and then you get an answer. Or you do math to say, will this work or not? And you're trying to find, will it work, yes or no? And design thinking is kind of a completely different approach than that. So first thing you do is you don't do any math. You uh, stop with the math. And um, you stop with the crazy obsession about failure. You don't worry about it. Um, and the reason is you can learn a lot from failure. You can, you, once you fail, you can see where did it fail, why did it fail, and you can start to make um, better decisions from that. So, um, the, and also the real world is a little bit different than kind of the engineering world. Um, with engineering, we have, uh, you know, we have a lot of math and we have a lot of science. We have um, fancy, you know, computer programs that can, uh, tell us if something will fail. Um, but the problem with that is that it, it's like a calculator, right? So you have numbers in, numbers out. Um, if the numbers that you put into the equation aren't right, you're not gonna get the right answer. It, and a lot of things are unexpected in the real, real world and we don't know a lot of things. So for myself, um, after taking this class, uh, or taking for a, a couple weeks, it kinda hit home and um, I've started to shift what we're doing on the team to something completely different. So a lot of the kids, 
um, are worried about failure. They don't want to fail, right? In class, we kind of learn you don't want to get an F, you want to get an A. That's what you want. Um, with the team, we're doing something completely different. Um, I'm saying try something, come up with ideas, be as crazy as you want. We can, we can make it and let's see if it works. If not, oh well, we'll make a new one. If it does, that's great. Um, and we'll let it work. And also, a lot of kids are scared, right? So a lot of freshmen and sophomores that come in um, that I'm working with, hey, do you have any ideas? And the response to me is, no, I don't. I don't know anything. <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's really, it's, it's kind of rough because once you get to know these people and start to work with them, you start to say, hey, they have crazy ideas. They have wonderful ideas. And just, they, they don't want to be wrong. And the thing is, you know, it's okay to be wrong. And sometimes the, the wrong ideas can lead to something new. The um, phones, right? The iPhone was kind of a crazy idea. Who would want a brick in your pocket, right? Engineers would probably say it's a dumb idea. We don't want to do that. But here we are. Everyone kind of has that. So um, a personal experience. Sorry, I'm probably taking a little no, bit no, too no. long. But um, I know you wanted kind of an a engineering kind of thing. So for us, we're building a control station. Um, so usually, the way you would design a con uh, control station would be um, kind of the robot and then, hey, what controls do you need to make the robot go up, down, left, right, and everything in the water, right, and close and open up a, a claw. So you kind of design it around the programmers, they make a program and everything. Well, this year we're taking a step back and we're throwing that all up. And we're saying, um, first of all, how do we want to control this thing? And we're taking uh, a lot of the team members and a couple of the team members from last year who actually drove the robot around and said, how, what works best for you? How do you want to make this thing move? So usually uh, we have a controller and then we have another controller and we have a couple buttons. So um, originally you would think you'd have controllers, um, you know, right here. And with math and everything, it has to be precisely this far apart. So this year we kind of changed that and we took someone in and said, stand here, put the controllers here, where do you want it? Where does it feel best? Where is it ergonomically right? Where does it feel good? And uh, they kind of moved it around, and boom. We got a spot, and it was actually angled, not straight on. Um, so we, we're, we changed the design a little bit for that. Um, but then we took another person, and we said, hey, try this out. Does this work for you? And it didn't. They just had to move it a little bit. So uh, we're actually changing the control station, so now it's adjustable. So just mostly you come in, you think, oh, it goes here, this goes here very kind of strategical and everything, and um, it's, people aren't like that. People are, are a lot more free-flowing. Um, and then one final thing, and I'll get out of your hair and let you continue talking. Um, we had a class project um, in class, and that was to kind of redesign a room, or redesign a living space. And uh, we actually got to go to this, one of the class, one of the guy's apartments, and um, he's super organized. Like he has his life down to the minute of what he's doing. It's kind of crazy. Um, but his desk and everything, at least in his eyes, is somewhat disorganized. Um, it, it, it blows me away, but whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, so through through classes and through co-ops, I learned a couple manufacturing methods. One of them, five S or lean um, process, where you have a, a place for everything. You have a place for this tool, a place for this tool, and in theory, you know, it should be perfect. It should work out every time. Um, we tried it, and we, you know, said here, homework assignments go right here. Pencil goes here. We mocked up his desk. It looked kind of crazy, but we had a spot for everything, and uh, we told him to start to use it. And it was actually somewhat of a struggle because people and humans and the way you interact in life isn't like a robot. Robots are real good at repetition. We're not like that at all. So when he did, uh, you know, an art project, or when he did some calculus, or when he did some, uh, you know, other class, um, it, it didn't work out because he needed more space or he needed less space. So um, just putting the user first is kind of, at least for people, a, a little bit different. So that's kind of what I have. I know it's kind of all over the place, but uh, yeah. That's Wait, did come up with a great, yeah. simple design yeah. for him that I saw he had it in class. Monday and was using it. Yeah, so in the end we went with a different approach, a little prototype, um, some clay, and uh, he uh, has like credit cards that he likes to write on, so he can have straight lines, and um, those would get stick, stuck to the table, right, they're flat to pick them up, so we actually made an upright stand for him, and a pencil holder, 
so the pencil wouldn't roll off and the cards wouldn't get stuck or roll off. So uh, he started to use that and kind of, hey, what do you need? And uh, that's worked really well. And he said uh, it's made his life a lot easier. So Good. Thank you, Ben. So empathetic research, engaging in conversations with people watching and listening. Um, once you do that, then you, you have to construct a point of view that's based on their needs. Um, for example, imagine a way to drink water on the go. go. Have my students come up with a design statement or a design question before uh, we start ideating. And again, I, I do teach this in a linear fashion. Um, and then later in the semester, we'll see where they may start someplace else, as long as they come back to who is your user. Um, prototype, it, it can be three-dimensional or two-dimensional. I encourage a three-dimensional prototype um, because you can engage in that um, better. Uh, but two-dimensional is great, especially if it's something you're just doing really quickly or don't maybe even have access to some other materials. Storyboarding, role-playing is always hilarious and fun. Um, but there's lots of different ways, as you know, to prototype. And then, you know, as Ben was talking um, about testing that, setting it up, create that experience. And even if you think it's going to work and it's great, if it doesn't work for that person, it's a flop, it's a failure. That's no big deal. Try something else. Try something different. Um, take a different approach. So always keeping the, the user in mind. Let's see what that picture was. Oh, it's, I just have all these. Michelangelo things up there, right? Sorry. You gotta be flexible. And we are as educators, aren't we? So, so what should you remember? Um, empathy. Empathy is the key regardless. Um, with design thinking, the, the traditional way of innovative thinking and innovation, it's really, it's not changed so much, it's just enriched. So I'm not saying don't do what you normally do, but how about enrich it in a way that you uh, look at the user first? How about enrich your ideas by doing something super crazy or something so innovative that you don't think it can be done, but wow, it's a great idea. Um, and, and I always say, if you can think it, and you can prototype it, it can happen. Maybe not in our lifetime, but it can happen. And, and again, the need for creative ideas has never been greater, right? Things are moving fast. Um, so just a positive and creative uh, way to work. And we're, we're going to jump into some innovative uh, prototyping and teamwork here in just a minute. Are, are there any questions before I move on? Anything you thought of I'm going to throw out there? This prototype right here is one of my very favorites, and look at it. Prototypes are often ugly. They're not anything you're going to put in an art show, right? Well, maybe. Um, this is a design that a team came up with uh, when we were doing the spatial design or spatial redesign, and, and the assignment is to go where you spend a lot of time to study, work, whatever. And this team, it's been a couple semesters ago, if that's irrelevant, um, they went to the library to the second floor. And long story short, they developed this little prototype, and it's, okay, it's a table, right? But the sides could either fold down or slide down, and, and uh, they had little wheels on it so they could slide them together to work in teams. Or they could pull that back or pull up those sides to block out sound, noise, and other distractions. What a great table, you know? Um, what a simple, profound idea. We also do stuff with e-waste. This is one of Hannah's um, projects where she just she took everything she could find and used an exacto knife to cut different states. And she started getting orders for these things. Um, and made some money, so that was fun. But maybe you're just using a plastic bag and determining um, uh, 
how to you know, keep someone dry. All right? So would you like to try it? Am I starting to sound like wah, 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 Charlie Brown, teacher? Would you like to try it? So on the back of that paper or on another piece of paper, I just want you to think about a typical day. Just block everything else out, except hearing my voice, right? Um, what bothers you or challenges you on a typical day? You do not have to show this to anybody, okay? You're not going to have to share that with anyone at all. But starting from the time you wake up in the morning, breakfast, going to work, school, whatever, and take yourself, just imagine yourself going through your day. What stands out that bothers you? Until the time you go to sleep. Whenever, if you decide to do something with this in your classroom, um, it's a great way to teach students um, to just kind of relax, you know, just kind of chill, and a great way to help them practice communicating, getting to know other people, because I don't always let them work together. I make, I group them in commonalities, I'm like brown eyes, green eyes, you know, blue eyes, or um, we play this little game where they walk around and sign if they love cats or country music or, or whatever. And, and we kind of, we make it fun just to kind of break it up. So I'll have um, people that, well, let's just do this. Who loves cats? Stand up. Stand up and stretch your legs. You've been sitting. Who loves cats? Look around and see who these cat lovers are. Look at this. So you've got these things right here. So there are some commonalities right there, but it's different from what department are you in, okay? You don't have to be in, uh, you know, a philosophy department to love cats. Okay, what about country music? Stand up if you love country music. No one stand, one? <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> I would stand, but I have, but it's not just, that's too big of a genre. Okay, this is true. This is true, I, and again, I'm being very broad. Soft rock. Soft rock. Stand up if you love soft rock. Yeah. You're okay. All right. How about stand up if you can speak two or more languages? That one was definitely broad. Okay, look around. Look around. Who can speak two or more languages? Now, when I do this in my class, we spend a little more time and and they speak, they tell us something in the languages they know, we try to guess what it is, and um, I have them make cat gestures, their favorite cat gesture before they sit down, you know, so we get kind of silly, um, but it's fun. Uh, who can play a musical instrument? That's always a curious one. Musical instruments? Any, anyone? Audrey's the only one that can play, nobody learned how to play the recorder in elementary school. Okay. Okay. All right, good. All right. Uh, who has children? Stand up. Stand up. Stretch your legs. Good. Get your blood moving. Okay. Yeah. Lots to talk about there. What about what, who has uh, the favorite color of green? <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. What? Who skips breakfast? Never. All right. Okay, so again, it's just kind of loosening people up and, and helping them realize that they have things in common. It's lining them up by their birthday and, um, you know, looking each other in the eyes and saying, well, what color are your eyes? You know, um, and making those connections cause, because connections are so incredibly important. Okay, um, so I want you to pick one subject from your bothers me list. If you only have one, that's what you're going to write on the sticky note. If you didn't have any, you don't need to write anything. Okay? I'm going to pass around this box. It's a box of bothersome things. I made sure it was small. All right? And I just don't put your name on it. Just write the subject of what bothers you. And then please 
please place it in there and pass it on. Okay, and then in a few minutes, I'm going to read those and we'll select teams. Actually, maybe I should run around. <laughs> That's kind of a broad. <laughs> Let's see if any of you can identify with these things. Don't want to wake up. Oh, this is one. Cell phones in class. Studying. Too many emails. Unsubscribe. Stupidity. <laughs> No, I'm <laughs> um, not knowing what to fix for dinner. Motivate students to do better research. Students who don't show up. Pins that stop writing midstream. <laughs> Time. Time. Uh, getting out of my warm bed in cold air. That yeah. happened this morning. Can't adjust the heat or AC in my office. Yeah. A long commute. Here's another email. Puppy not being taken out in time. Ah, oh, in there too. All right. Okay, so what we're going to do is you're going to select a team. And if you want your team to be the table you're sitting at, that's great. If it's just two people, if it's five people, it really doesn't matter. If you want to move to someone that loves cats because you love cats too, um, I'm going to let you make that decision. Now, when you get to your team, this is in there, right? Yes. 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 It's in that way too. Thank you. So, this is just um, what I call a design thinking quick sheet. This is how I help students just quickly do the process, go through the process in a simple way that doesn't take much time, okay? Um, so, go ahead and get in your teams. If you're gonna move, move. If not, just kinda snuggle up to each other a little more. Or actually, um, it's the heart of this table that's awesome that you're all facing each other. <laughs> okay, be in this team. Are you doing this sometimes? Yeah. yeah, did you have to move over here somewhere? Yeah. You guys need a bigger team. Okay, oh, okay. now, the other team, would you send <laughs> the, <laughs> the oldest person on the team up to pick up uh, one of these problems? It's not me. Dis or discuss what problem you want them to get and come get it. Okay, so on this quick sheet, really only one person should write on this quick sheet. And if you want a blank copy, I can send you that or whatever. Um, so just one person is going to write on this quick sheet. I can't spell like this. This Yeah. All right. Now, this is where I'm going to be talking a lot and interrupting you a lot, but you definitely need to be talking too. So I'll try to use my teacher voice. I don't really have one. Um, so subject. Look at what was chosen. Okay. Share it with your team members, and then one person is writing on a quick sheet. What's the subject? It should be basically what they wrote, right? Now, I want you to take a couple of minutes here. What are two positives about that subject? Um, right below here it says generate a list of problems. There are no bad answers, right? So just throw those problems out there, a list. What is bad about getting out of bed? You know, a warm bed. What do you not like about it? Throw that to the person that's writing, the person that's writing or scribing, you write too. Um, as many as you can come up with. <laughs> what about the reply on the Oh my gosh. Yes. And then generated a list of problems. Now what I would like for you to do, right here, writing or drawing, whatever, in this piece of the pie, what's the real problem? Is it really getting out of bed? Is it really too many emails? You know, is it, is it really... Uh, is it really not getting the dog out in time? What, what
what is the true problem? So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to discuss, and you're going to come up with a design statement. You're trying to communicate. Okay? Okay. What's the true problem? Or is it there's not enough time in the I was going to say, it's a good time. I think it's a good time. I would like for your team to come up with what's called a design statement, or it may be a design question. Here's some examples that may or may not apply to you, okay? These are just some prompts I have up here. So a design statement would be, imagine a pleasant way to wake up. Imagine a way to drink water on the go. Create a new backpack that easily carries a heavy load. So it's just a simple sentence or question. Design a better method of transportation. So you, what you're going to do now, whoops. Whoops. <laughs> okay, what you're gonna do now in this little spot right here, you're going to write your design statement or question, okay? Design statement or question. Julie, what's your design, what is your team's design statement? Imagine a way to automatically categorize and file your emails for you. Okay, so see how she can bring that down, how they can bring that down though? Even more specific, imagine a way to categorize emails. Yeah. It's Make it even back. more simple. Okay, how about this team right here? So ours was uh, the students not coming to class, and so our statement was create accountability for students for class attendance. Great, great. So just create student accountability. Audrey, what do you what do you guys have? What would it look like to establish connection via empathy or sympathy with a stupid person? <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, I love Saying that a stupid person wouldn't understand <laughs> that. Stop. <laughs> no, I'm trying to uh, make it a little more, a little shorter. A little shorter. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> what would it? Um, what would it look like to establish connection via empathy or sympathy with a stupid person? I think that's about as short as we get. Or can you think of something? How can you establish a connection instead of what would it look like to? How can you establish a connection? Sometimes you just ask why. <laughs> okay. Alright, how about right here? Ours was an email thing too, and ours was imagine receiving only important to me emails. Oh, that's good. Okay. Yeah. One more time. Imagine receiving only important to me emails. <laughs> okay. Um, normally we would take a little bit of time to talk about this a little bit more. Um, we would research it any way you would want to research it. Typically, talking to other people, not just people in your team and on your team, and we go out and do that. Um, what I would like for you to do right now is grab a post-it. And I just want you to come up with one idea. Now, if we were if we had a lot more time, I would say every idea you come up with, put it on a different post-it. But just grab one post-it and individually, without discussing it, let's have some ideation. What is your idea? But don't worry about anybody else right now. Just what is your idea? Now, typically what we do in my class is everybody puts their ideas out on the table and um, they vote individually on what they think is the best idea. What we do is we put um, a star on what they think is most innovative, each person, um, and they put a check mark on what they think is most practical. And then as a team, they decide which one that they want to tackle together. And sometimes that takes a lot of time. Other times it's like, oh, yep, this is definitely it. All right? So once your team is ready to share your idea, we'll skip the little voting thing so we can move here. But go ahead and share and pick one. You don't have to vote or anything, just 
Unless you're disagreeing, then you may need to vote. Can you make it 3D? Um, in the middle of the table, you have a lot of different supplies that you could create something three-dimensional as a team, but it, it may be that uh, you're going to draw it. I'd love it if you build it, no matter how ugly or awful it would look. Okay? How can you construct it? Or are you going to have to act it out? And I'm going to come around and see how you're doing, but let's go ahead and build your prototype. Okay? Or a logo, or a trademark, or whatever, and then it will do these things we want it to do. Just to actually have something tangible, whether whether it's 3D or maybe it's maybe it's a drawing. A simple, you know, logos are simple, not complicated, and then then someone else would have to do all the programming, right? But for um, now, I'm actually thinking about doing. But that could be a prototype of like, vacation, except the. You could always say that you're on vacation. We can create some activities. What we're gonna do is give each time each team just a couple of minutes to present their prototype and their idea. Okay? I think probably the most challenging thing is people worry about what it looks like. Okay, you don't need to worry about what it looks like. Okay? Alright, so <laughs> Let's start with Audrey back there. You guys, will you uh, tell us your design statement? I'm sorry, I just don't want you guys. Well, Dr. Sun just told me if I went one minute over, you guys would hate me. I don't want that to happen. Yes. So let's give um, attention back here to uh, this table, to the office table. I don't know where this thing is. So we have made uh, prototypes. Our, our statement was about uh, what would it look like or how would you establish a connection via empathy or sympathy with a stupid person. Um, so we this, made models. Yeah. Um, and this is the stupid person because they're just, they, they have no head and they just have their hands up like, I don't know. So that's our stupid person. And we had a couple of ideas, uh, one of which was to put yourself in a situation in which you don't know much. Yes, and, and learn about what that feels like. Um, or to role play a situation with a partner uh, in which you can explore creative solutions to um, working with others who are different. <laughs> Excellent. So what you need to do is you need to, everyone needs to have these and you take them back and you set them on your desk so when you have to deal with these stupid people in front of you, okay, I need to try to be in the desk challenging. Okay, great. How about back here? Okay, <laughs> so. Sign a statement again. Uh, oh, uh, imagine a way to auto-categorize emails. So the name of our software product is called Filtrex. And it filters all of your emails and puts them into categories for you yeah. based on the patterns of the wording in your emails. So we mentioned a bunch like overload, like a cornucopia or a funnel, and all this mm -hmm. side becomes all beautiful, spiffy, organized, <laughs> not a mess. What a, what a great start. And then someone else will need to program that. Yeah, yeah, our well, friend said, we would have come and be like, what a great visual. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, or we could tilt it to the side to figure out that it's like a tunnel. Yeah. 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 And this is how it starts. <laughs> this is how you're going to make the big bucks. Yeah. Sure. Really? And the same right difference that we immediately figured out, it wasn't so much the fact that there were too many emails, it was the fact that we didn't have a way to get them. The problem solved by only paying attention That's to the true. things that we needed. Yeah, and from the user's perspective, mm -hmm. so giving the user the ability to create his or her own yeah. categories, not imposing, you know, 
job, whatever school. So, so it would force you to take a category. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's great. You would have to create it your own. And unsubscribe has to be one of those categories. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, so ours was the create accountability for class attendance and our, our, our prototype looks a lot like this because we were going to have the students get involved in these type of activities in class um, and then evaluate each other. So they would be a whole accountable to the other students in the class rather than to the instructor. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. That's Giving them that responsibility but also empowering them. Uh, my youngest daughter was uh, her first day of class um, one of her professor or her professor said, "This is what we're going to do. You're going to design the class. You know, design the class." And she absolutely hated it. Well, at this point now, she loves it because she ha she says they have ownership um, yes. of what the expectations are. And she said they have discovered it. They made it more difficult on themselves than the professor would have. So. It's kind of like we grade ourselves harder than... Okay, how about here? That's wonderful. All right. Well, so we started with basically an idea where some are good and those emails come through and then other bad emails that we just are, don't, do not have time for, they bounce back. And then we decided, but you know, the filters that currently exist still come through. So therefore, we developed the slingshot and the spring oh. to send them back. <laughs> and that we were going to then send them with an auto note that says, I'm sorry, you have exceeded your quota of emails to this individual for the week, and you'll need to contact her in some other way. Wow. <laughs> you know what? You guys are so creative. <laughs> Incredible. All right, so this is, I have some goals for you. You may want these to be your goals or they may just be my goals for you um, because you always have goals for your students right whether they rise to the occasion or not but I would like to challenge you to be more human centered I'd like to challenge you to spend more time with people whose lives you impact whether it's family or students or co-workers I, I would like to challenge you to spend more time with those people True time, face-to-face -face time, not email time or phone time, but take time to do that. Um, I would like to challenge you to have an attitude of prototyping and not worrying about what it looks like, whether it's a little notebook, you know, you keep in your pocket or purse and you jot something down or you draw, stick people or whatever, or, or you grab a cup and you turn it into something else. So I want to challenge you to have an attitude of prototyping, all right? I also want to challenge you to collaborate with other people, not just people in your family, not just people in your office, even though you're focusing on those people, right? Because those are the people you're impacting. But I want to challenge you to talk to people outside of your tribe about things that may be bothersome within your office or your department or your family or a global concern that you have, okay? Um, and I want you to be biased to taking action instead of hoping someone else will fix it or instead of complaining about it. I want to challenge you to take action because every single one of us makes a difference, makes an impact in some way. You know, we're so important we, that everything we do and everything we say impacts someone, even ourselves, right? So I challenge you to be biased to taking action, collaborate with others, um, have an attitude of prototyping, and spend more time with your tribe. All right? Um, you guys, there's so many resources out there, especially if you truly go into your class and do this. I mean, it's mind-blowing. That, that's why I always go back to um, the, the people that have really spent a lot of time on this, which is um, the, the D School, the Design School, Stanford, um, IDO. They all work closely together. Incredible 
amounts of resources and free, th free downloads, free books, free kits uh, that you can use just right away. Um, and there's, all, there's just all kinds of <coughs> online stuff. I do recommend David, uh, or I'm sorry, I do recommend, uh, yeah, David Kelly's, no, it's Tom Kelly's book, Creative Confidence. David helped you know a little bit. Glimmer is an older book by Warren Berger. Um, I've spent a lot of time talking to Warren Berger through email, okay? But an incredible man who um, has some great ideas, and his newest book is called A More Beautiful Question. And again, it's what is really the problem. All right, and then I love Dr. Bertram and Dream Differently. What a great book. All right, questions? Let's see. Um, 1.42, we got out three minutes early. Unless someone has a question.